Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Klaus Hessler. Klaus, how are you? <laughs> hey, all fine here. Thanks so much. Great to be on the show. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm honored to have you here. We're, we're here today to talk about Moeller and then Jim Chapin and your lessons with him. And then we're going to get into some more rudimental stuff, which you're very famous for um, and, and all that good stuff. So we are uh, it's it's about four in the afternoon for me, but it's it's about 10 p.m. for you. You're you're yeah. you're going late here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I'm a big boy, so don't worry too much. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I just want to make sure you get to bed on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, can you please just run me through what is the molar technique? And then we'll go through him as a person, but just maybe what what is the technique? Yeah. I mean, mostly I, in a nutshell, I would say molar technique is uh, um, is a method of movement, I should say, which goes back to European drumming traditions that can be traced back even, I would say, easily to the 1400s. Hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, of, of course, at a certain point, uh, those European drumming traditions, uh, which are mostly rooted in Switzerland and France and certain parts of Germany, they have been exported to, uh, to the New World, which later became the US, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned to be the Mola technique after the influence uh, and, and, and anything happening around the era of, uh, the, era of the, the Revolutionary War, then the Civil War, and uh, it really became the Mola technique after Sanford Moeller had watched and analyzed veterans of the U.S. Army somewhere by the mid-1920s. Uh, and it was... Uh, um, it was actually not Moeller who gave his name to the technique. It was more or less his students that would say, I am practicing the technique of Sanford Moeller, or I'm using Moeller's system, or I'm using the technique of Sanford Moeller, and eventually it became Moeller technique. But it was not Sanford Moeller himself who would say, this is now my technique. He was very much aware of the aspect that uh, he had just pretty much... Uh, stolen let's say sure and adapted this technique by watching veterans that had served in the army and played uh field drums uh in the civil war that's pretty much the 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 story about it yeah no that's interesting yeah dom uh, famulara was on the show a fellow mapex drummer and he um he spoke a little bit about that about how you watch these guys who were 90 years old getting such huge hits and you know such great volume and they're um they're so just i mean these are great civil war veterans you know and they're still able to get that much power so and i know also with uh the stone george lawrence stone stuff it was similar where he didn't sit down and write stick control per se they just put together a lot of his pages so i think that makes sense that someone else gives you the name, the Moeller technique. You can't say this yeah. is I'm Moeller and this is my technique. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> although at, at times people do things like that, but, uh, oh, yeah. but I mean, it's, it, it's really hard to come up with something which is absolutely, absolutely new under the sun. Sure. And especially with an instrument, which is as old as the drums, almost anything you can think of has been done before by one or the other person. So, uh, yeah. uh, so it's, it's really hard to say this, this is my thing and it has not been done before. Yeah, very true. That's true in pretty much everything in life. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, now why don't we talk about Sanford Moeller as a person? Um, you were mentioning before we were recording, he goes, his family goes back to Germany, which, um, I should have mentioned before, but you're obviously German. You are in Germany, correct? Yeah. Right. Correct. So, uh, yeah. Tell us about him as a person. Well, um, I mean, um, Stanford Moeller, as, and what I'm telling you now is, is pretty much based on what, uh, on what I learned from Jim about, uh, about Stanford Moeller and a couple of, of things I read about Stanford sure. Moeller as I was, uh, sort of diving more in, into the issue. Uh, I think Stanford Moeller was a relatively late starter on the drums. Uh, so he went to the army, he fought in the Spanish-American War, I think, and, uh, and started drumming relatively late. And um, uh, so he was under the influence and under the teachings uh, of a couple of drummers that, uh, 
that would uh, uh, that would play in in the um, in the band of uh, John Philip Sousa, for mm -hmm. instance, um, and uh, well, then Moller pretty much uh, was uh, was uh, uh, the drummer in um, in a vaudeville act uh, by. Uh, famous George Cohan. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not aware of, or did, did you ever hear about George Cohan? Or yeah, I Dom uh, mentioned him on the um, on his episode, and I just remember him saying that he was basically the father of like modern Broadway as we know it. You, I, that's pretty much a f uh, w what it is, I guess. I mean, the the, the vaudeville scene is sure. say something like somebody is telling a joke and and uh, and there's some little acting and some music and some dancing and yep. then in the end everybody performs together and uh, that's pretty much it so uh yeah um so george cohan had this uh, vaudeville act and uh, and sanford moller was one of the drummers um and uh, the the story also goes that uh, for instance buddy rich was one uh, uh of the attractions actually in george cohan's um uh vaudeville show mm -hmm. um so it's very likely that that buddy rich as a young kid was listening and possibly even watching Sanford Moeller in the pit. Hmm. So who knows what what that connection was responsible for? Yeah, just saying. Yeah, of course. And um, it was pretty much uh, during his time with George M. Cohan and the and the traveling all across mostly the East Coast of the U.S. that uh, that Sanford Moeller would um, would visit veterans in their homes, and uh, he would always have something to drink and, uh, and, 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 and tobacco. And he would, he would talk to the, to the veterans and, uh, and he would have them play drums for him, the, the, their field drums. And of course, what they did was they, they would pretty much duplicate uh, certain routines that they used to perform uh, during their, uh, their service in, in the, in the U S army. So they would play the three camps and the downfall of Paris. They would play the tunes, and the orders and the and the drum beatings that they were aware of, and uh, I, I, I would assume they were not playing exercises like Jim Chapin later made them famous. I assume they were mostly playing tunes, and yeah. out of playing uh, these uh, say rudimentary classics like Dixie and the Downfall of Paris and Turkey in the Straw and uh, British Grenadiers and and anything that that you had to play when you were a, a drummer in the army, Moller pretty much watched and analyzed their movements, and he came up with the idea of, uh, uh, say, discovering the upstroke. Mm -hmm. He discovered a stroke in which the wrist would indicate the direction of the move. So so when Moller was referring to an upstroke, he would not refer to the tip of the stick. He would refer to the to the direction that the hand would travel at the time of the hit. And uh, it was always super important for them to have the stick in some sort of constant movement. So, so these guys back then, they most likely had a very different perception of playing as opposed to uh, what we see when we see um, modern contemporary um, rudimental guys perform. Um, so, so the the moving culture, I would even say, and the and the method of movement was quite different. And he analyzed that further with the whip and the upstroke and the flyback, hmm. which was nothing else than a different word for rebound. Sure. And uh, and all of these ingredients finally came to uh, to make Mola technique in in essence. I'd say. Wow, it's so neat to think of. Like it feels. The Civil War, obviously here in America, feels like it, it is a long time ago. But just to think that you're only a couple generations away from people being alive and learning from those people, just to sit there and watch these guys play. What was his era that he was in? Like when 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 would he have been born? And his you know when when did he die? Moeller. Well, I, M Moeller was was born I think eighty seventy nine, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And I think he died in the 1960s, 61 or 62, I think. Okay. Um, I'm, I may be wrong uh, for a couple of years, but that's sure. pretty much from 1880s to 1960s. I, th I think Moeller was 1879 to 61, 62, something like that. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, it was pretty much the same era as, uh, uh, as of George Lawrence Stone, who lived around the same time. Um, and uh, it also was about the same time that, uh, uh, that very influential uh, Swiss drummers and educators were, uh, were alive and working, like, uh, like the late great Dr. Fritz Berger, hmm. who was uh, one of, say, the most influential Swiss drumming guys. Sure. Yeah, I, I learned a little bit about the, um, the world of Swiss drummers when Mark Beecher was on the show, great rudimental mm -hmm. drummer. Yep. about learning about the Swiss army and all that cool stuff. Um, so that's neat. Now, obviously you are a very close student with Jim Chapin. So um, why don't we kind of, and in, in a parallel fashion, maybe talk about Moeller and then his, his students, right? Which uh, might be a naive thing to say, but so Chapin was a direct student of Moeller, correct? Yes, that, that that's correct. Um, uh, it should also be mentioned that um, uh, that Jim was a relatively late student of of Sanford Moeller, and uh, and I'm I'm mentioning that because uh, there are quite some differences between the early students of or relatively early students of Sanford Moeller, like for instance, say Gene Krupa, mm -hmm. uh, whose method of movement is quite different from what uh, from what Chapin uh, used to do. Uh, but uh, but Moller was always heavily into teaching, and he was uh, he seemed to be a very strict teacher, and uh, he mu he must have been a tough uh, a tough cookie, I, I should say. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just the teaching that that Moller was uh, uh, was absorbed with. Um, he also uh, built drums, and uh, the the story goes he would only sell you a drum. Uh, if you would play for him and if Mola would think you're no good, he would not sell you the drum. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from, from a today's perspective and, and, and aspect of marketing, possibly not that smart, but who knows what it was good for. No, so, man, he must've had a ton of students, obviously, but these guys who their name lives on for, you know, like he, the next hundred years, you must have a, you must spread your name and your lessons a lot over the years. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and and I mean, Moeller, he 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 must have been a very strict guy. I mean, uh, you possibly heard about the, the the famous march to Boston, where he he marched from from uh, say a, around two hundred forty miles. Uh, I mean, obviously not in one go, but every step on the on the march, he was playing the drums. Oh wow! As he was sort of under the impression that drumming should be an Olympic discipline. He wanted to be drumming Olympic. Man, N no kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I hadn't <laughs> and, heard that. That's wild. And, uh, and just uh, as uh, as uh, another side note was that uh, I think Moller was also a member of the Polar Bear Club, which included the aspect of him, say, uh, uh, swimming swimming in the ice water in winter. You would break the ice and jump in and uh, swim a couple of rounds or dive under the ice and then go out again. And he, and he would do that every day every winter Jeez. so i mean to Tough do that, that 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 <laughs> tells a lot about your your discipline and and the way you are as a person yeah big time um <laughs> now i forgot that uh i i knew I'd, I'd heard it on a couple episodes but i forgot that gene krupa was a uh, a student of molar which is which is funny because gene is known as just being like the nicest guy in the world um yes. Gene, you're right. He doesn't have the same technique that you see with the later guys. But um, isn't there some connection with Gene Krupa and Jim Chapin as well? Yes, sure, sure it is. And um, um, I should say that um, the, the the connection, or, or first of all, the the difference between between the movements of Gene and the movements of Jim was mostly that, uh, as I mentioned before, Gene was a, a relatively early student of Moeller. And and he was uh, and that was at the time when Moller was heavily under the uh, over exaggerated upstroke spell, I should say. Mm -hmm. And all his later students, uh, like Jim, for instance, uh, Moller would be very strict about not over exaggerating the upstroke and not drooping your wrist and and, and stick too much. And um, the connection with uh, or the connection between Gene and Jim. Pretty much goes back to uh, to Jim 
watching Benny Goodman uh, uh, in Manhattan uh, and going going to a gig with with Benny Goodman, I think it was, and uh, and Gene would just go backstage and uh, and ask Gene for lessons. Uh, now you must understand that uh, it's pretty much the same as if you would go to a to a sting gig and you're trying to go backstage and ask Vinny for a lesson. <laughs> yeah, this is not happening. This is not an option, right? No, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but but Jim actually did that. Wow. So uh, uh, so Gene, being that kind person that he was, he would say, "Kid, I don't teach, but uh, I I know a good teacher. Go to Sanford Mola. He's going to teach you what I can do." And uh, and that was in essence what uh, what Jim really did. So not that much later, uh, Jim finds himself performing uh, pretty much on almost the same bandstand as Gene Krupa, right opposite, hmm. and. Uh, uh, and Gene would listen to Jim and say, boy, I remember you, you're, you're the kid, you were asking me for lessons. Uh, and so you went to Moeller and obviously Moeller told you something uh, different as opposed to uh, what he showed me. Hmm. And uh, uh, so, so that was their, their first encounter then again. And then a couple of years later, still uh, Gene was, uh, was, was calling Jim four lessons and then in turn jim became the teacher of gene krupa so so the so the places had changed which which yeah. is some funny twist of of faith yeah it is um, but they're both but, such they both come off as very nice guys where it wouldn't be like a, i'm not going to take lessons from you i'm your superior it would be more of like a oh boy i can actually learn from you cool let's do it you know good for yeah. you for working yeah interesting hmm <laughs> now, two questions. I'm going to probably just jump in as things kind of pop into my mind here. I don't think I asked this before. Where was Moeller located? Was it in the New York area? It, I think it was New York area, right? Okay. They all were. Uh, Guys like me in Cincinnati, we don't get any of these famous uh, <laughs> teachers. Um, and uh, how long would a guy like Gene Krupa go to Moeller or Chapin for? Like, I imagine if you're. A professional drummer do you go in that in that case um to learn the technique and then go you know spread your wings and fly and then you're off because you know it's not the same as a young student taking lessons for six years with a teacher and going from yeah baby drummer to you know what was a typical run of a yeah i i think uh, moeller was relatively well known for the aspect of throwing students out once he was under the impression that uh -huh. he, he was not able to show them anymore. So I think um, Jim's time with Sanford Moeller was around a year. Okay. It, it wasn't that much more. And um, uh, th that's, that's at least what, what Jim told me. And I would think it, it may have been pretty much the same with Krupa, although I don't know for sure. Okay. Man, that's just everything about him. Like, like when I... Um I taught at like Sam Ash, big music store here and stuff in through college. And, uh, I was like gripping onto every student for the income. Like, no, no, let's keep learning. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Moeller's like, I'm not going to sell you a drum. You're done taking lessons. So he must've been uh, doing okay on money there and not had to, I guess it was a different, different time. Yeah. It, it was a, a very different, uh, uh, perception of, uh, of learning and methodology, uh, as we have it today. And, Parts of it were possibly pretty cool and, uh, and, and, and could even be maintained still today, while other parts of it, of course, uh, <laughs> may need an update. Sure. <laughs> that, that, is, that is for sure. But I also remember times when, uh, when, I, was, uh, when I was asking Jim about his, um, his experiences in, uh, in lessons with, with Moeller, and, and he really came up with, with quite some some funny things like uh, I, I remember one time I was asking Jim, uh, boy, Jim, do you still remember what was your first lesson like with, uh, uh, with Moeller? And, uh, and Jim said, yes, sure. First lesson, uh, Jim had bought Moeller's book, The Art of Snare Drum. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and he goes to the lesson and says, good day, Mr. Moeller. Uh, yeah, listen, I bought your book. Here, here's your book. And, uh, and Moeller says, Oh Jim, I wish you had. I wish you hadn't bought the book. The book is no good. 
the book is all wrong. And he <laughs> and he said that with, uh, I mean, it, it, it sounded very disappointed almost. Yeah. And uh, and 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 I would ask, come on, wh why was that? I mean, here's the person who wrote the book, but but the author is saying my own book is not good. So so why is that? And uh, and it, it turned that uh, that Moller was not happy at all with the pictures in the beginning section uh -huh. that showed the movements of the whip because the, the movements were so over-exaggerated and he was not happy with that. Wow. So, um, okay. uh, Bit of I a think he even talked to the, to the guys at Ludwig and, and they would say, uh, now listen, the, the book sells quite well and it was, awful, it, it was an awful amount of work to, to put the pictures together. Uh, we just leave it as it is. And, uh, and the book <laughs> is still in the very same shape today. Oh, wow. <laughs> What, how do you think the pictures represent it as a, you know, kind of a master of this method? Do you think they're, they're crazy out of line? Um, I mean, they are interesting uh, since they pretty much describe the, 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 the over-exaggeration of the upstroke that, that Moeller was, was under in his beginning years when he was uh, starting to put word out about his, uh, his technique. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a today's standpoint, I would say the pictures are possibly not good because they mm -hmm. really don't represent the way of how the technique would be used in the best possible way. And Jim was not referring at all uh, to these pictures in his strategy of teaching uh, Moeller's technique. Gotcha. Interesting, you know, and it's just a side note that maybe it's a future episode with someone from Ludwig, but it's 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 neat how Ludwig was so involved with the publishing of a lot of these really early books. Like I think Stick Control originally was thanks to Ludwig and stuff. So um, now let's talk a little bit more about um, Jim Chapin. So we know Moeller kind of came up playing with Sousa, and and that was like his, you know, not claim to fame, but that was like you know you're you're a big working musician. Now Jim Chapin. He was a working drummer, correct? He wasn't just a, uh, not that there's anything wrong with it, but like a, um, a lifelong teacher. Like he was a performer, right? Yes, true. Yeah. Okay. Now, Jim, when did he pass away? He's, he's a very legendary guy, but I don't know when he passed away. Uh, yeah, Jim, Jim was born July 23, 1919. And, okay. uh, and he passed away July 4, 2009. Oh, wow. And uh, so, so he, he, he died. He passed away only, say, a couple of days shy of his 90th birthday. Man, what a life. Wow. And, uh, yeah, what a life. So, I mean, one of, the, one of the guys absolutely who saw uh, the evolution of modern drum set and uh, leaving heavy footprints in that history of how the instrument came together and, uh, and how certain, say, parts of it were even say invented i mean the the instrument was not the same when jim started out to play as as compared compared to the days when when he finally passed away it was a totally different instrument mm -hmm. so uh, so he was really born into uh, uh, very exciting times and uh, and the, the interesting thing still about his death day 4th of july obviously is that uh, that jim was a big fan of of independence um, which is why he wrote his first book, which was heavily, un uh, uh, I mean, uh, came together under the spell of what he did with Moeller. But uh, so the father of modern drumming independence dies on Independence Day. And, uh, and Jim <laughs> once mentioned that uh, if, if he could pick his death day, it would be July 4, because he was a huge fan of John Adams. Yeah, uh, who was one of the the founding fathers sure. of uh, of the American Constitution, uh, together with some, uh, with Thomas Jefferson, um, yeah. and uh, and just for that for that sake alone, he would pick July four as his death day, and he finally made it exactly to that, which is just amazing. I think that is that's so cool. He seems like a very nice guy, um, and I think I talked to. Um, a little bit at PASIC, I talked to Jason Edwards from uh, ProLogic's Percussion a little bit about his lessons. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that with, uh, with, with Jim as well and um, kind of echoes what you're saying of, of him just being a nice guy. He, Jim, it's just kind of funny. He looks like a nice guy. You know what I mean? I'm sure he was very um, 
he wanted you to work. What, what was it like taking lessons with him? And on that note, was it primarily on the pad? Were you on the drum set? Um, and you're in Germany. How did this even work for you? I mean, what was, what was the story with, with you taking lessons with him? That's a lot of questions there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, taking a lesson with Jim was always a bit of an adventure. Now, quite some of my lessons with him took place um, uh, in the US um, uh, on Long Island. I mean, some of the first ones uh, back um, in the Long Island Drum Center, where Dom also used to teach hmm. alongside with, uh, with Jim and uh, Al Miller, for instance, who was another uh, great Long Island drummer and another uh, teacher of Dom, actually. And uh, um, it also appeared that um, that every day or every year when, when Jim would, would come over to Germany, usually many times twice a year for Musikmesse, which was usually somewhere spring, March, April, and then another time, many times around fall, October, November, he would stop by at my place. He would, he would stay at, uh, at, my, at, at the house of my parents-in-law, and I would just try to organize as much work for him as possible. <laughs> And uh, of course, That's then great. also taking lessons with him. But uh, it was uh, it was many times an adventure because um, Jim didn't make victim uh, didn't make uh, victims when he uh, <laughs> when he was teaching. Uh, it was uh, he would just go for it. But whenever you you had a, a, a question, his his answers would always be in detail exactly what you wanted to hear. Hmm. He was not cryptical. He was not. Uh, coming up with strange comparisons that you would not understand. He was very hands-on and he would teach each student uh, with the utmost amount of respect, no matter if it was a seasoned pro who had been playing the drums for years and years or if it was somebody who, who was just starting out to play the drums. Jim did not care. Everybody was, uh, everybody got the same amount of uh, of attention hmm. and uh and it was it was both on the pad and the drums whatever was around he was traveling with his set of uh, say copied pages uh, either out of his books volume one or volume two and a couple of handwritten sheets which are spread all over the all over the planet i think i i run into these these copied uh, handwritten sheets of jim everywhere that's funny uh, so that was pretty much uh, his routine yeah Hmm. That's cool, man. In inner, uh, intercoastal drum lessons there. Now, was it a pretty standard priced lesson? I mean, that's probably a, a silly question, but like, he's kind of a legendary guy. Was it still like the standard, you know, 40, $50 for an hour in, in comparison to the inflation and all that? Uh, Jim, actually one of the, one of the very few malfunctions in the in the in the business model of, of Jim Shape and I would say was that Jim never had a, a, a real concrete idea what he wanted to charge for a lesson. I mean, I I would pay him, of course, but uh, and and I would whenever I would organize lessons for for Jim, I would of course say, okay, this is like sixty bucks, seventy bucks, yeah. eighty, what whatever the the rate was. But sure. I have encountered. Uh, say countless situations where where Jim would just give lessons for free, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, man, because he was so enthusiastic about uh, uh, about teaching and drumming, and uh, he would completely forget about time and oh, wow. be off schedule uh, already at two in the afternoon and there was still a whole day of teaching in, in front of him and, oh, uh, and and you were pretty much just trying to to get things sort of organized and, and to keep everything kind of on schedule but uh, wow. um, yeah. trying to uh, to really pay Jim the amount that that he really deserved at times was challenging let me put it this way man that's interesting it's so funny him and him and even kind of going back to Moeller about not really working out that great with the marketing and the money side of things. Um, <laughs> but I guess it's just the love of teaching. I've had that with my experience taking lessons um, now with Barry, who's kind of of that earlier generation is it'll be an hour and a half in. And um, I remember back when I was teaching, it was like on the hour. It's like, all right, someone else has to start now. Like, you know, like 
I would always say the train doesn't stop. Like if one person gets off, then the rest of the day is off. So <laughs> it's <laughs> not a concern, I guess. Um, yes, now, um, as we kind of maybe we'll move on to something else here, but like, can you name off some? Obviously, you are, but who are some drummers that we all might know who use the molar technique? Uh, th that's a good question. Um, and I mean, we would have to make a difference between drummers who have the information obviously from Jim himself okay, and yeah. uh, who know th what, what they are doing. And there are still, on the other hand, quite some drummers who use the same principles, but they never took a lesson with Jim. Got it. And, uh, and, and we would also have to make a difference between uh, any sort of formal lessons and formal students who would really reach out to Jim and uh, stop by and then take a lesson in his rooms where he was teaching or if it was just something, okay, we're going to stop by backstage and you're going to show me something on the pad real quick. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's a great but, point. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I know is that uh, Jim was always uh, a, a huge fan of Vinny and Vinny's traditional grip. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I think mostly for for the not 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 just for the aspect uh, of of Vinny's uh, musical and and rhythmic uh, um, say imagination, which is which is just beyond. He he just seems to be uh, the kind of player who can who can do anything. But yeah. uh, I know that Jim also loved Vinny's traditional grip for the for the sheer aspect of being one of the few guys who could really get a nice crack out of the drum and a good backbeat, uh, uh, still using traditional grip. Yeah. Um, so, so Jim loved that a lot. I, I know. And, uh, quite some other guys, of course, would include people like Kenny Aronoff, who, uh, who, who loved, uh, Jim's technique and, and was extremely grateful for, um, uh, for Jim's input because at some point I think Kenny was, uh, there were some 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 physical restraints and some physical challenges that that Kenny had at a certain time, and just letting go of the stick and uh, and using the the power and the relaxation uh, effects of of molar technique pretty much saved his life. That that's mm. that's what Kenny always used to say. Wow. Um, so, I mean, there are countless more people. Who would sure. use use the system? But these are just two that that come to my mind, which are very different uh, with uh, regards to 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 their drumming style and yeah. to their approach of music. But that just goes to say how universal uh, the technique really is, and that it's not just something for the jazz guys or for the rock guys or for or for whatever guy. It was uh, it, it seemed to be the 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 the, the perfect thing that you could organize all of your drumming with. Hmm, that's interesting. And you said too, that like it would be if you learned it from Jim or if you kind of copying what you saw or you learned backstage. So was Jim basically, Jim Chapin, was he basically like the gatekeeper? I mean, at that point, I'm sure other people were alive and teaching from taking lessons from Moeller, but it sounds like Jim was the guy, kind of like how it went Civil War drummers to Moeller Moeller yeah. to Chapin and obviously Gene Krupa and everyone, but he didn't, he taught, but not as much as Jim Chapin. So if you really wanted to learn this technique correctly, it basically had to be through Jim Chapin, correct? I, I would say so. And, uh, and there's also a word by, uh, by Sanford Moeller himself, who would say that, uh, that Jim was that one student of him who obviously, uh, understood best the, the techniques that Moeller was teaching and possibly even added some some little aspects on on top of it and and i think that was just for the pure sake of jim just uh, just being a genius mind he would he he would bring the ability of analyzing things and looking into the details and understanding what is really happening behind the curtain and he would include that into his teaching routines and moeller understood that and it even mm. went to the point where uh, um, I think Moeller also uh, gave Jim one of the drums that one of the U.S. Army veterans uh, uh, gave Moeller as a present in the 1920s. Oh, wow. 
So, uh, so, so Jim had this really old drum, which most likely has been played during the Civil War. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the drum got stolen when, uh, oh, God. Uh, when Jim's video, Speed Power Control Endurance, was shot because uh, Jim would, would never lock his car. And he just had this field drum, the, a rope tension field drum, with the molar eagle and the and the famous oh. depict with the eagle and the arrows that that was that was molar's sign on the on the drums he had a, a typical design that he used um uh and of course the, the car wasn't locked and it was sto uh, the, the drum was stolen and away you go so jeez so it's out there somewhere but uh yeah. somebody <laughs> has it i'm sure <laughs> uh, if you're listening then please uh send it to klaus because i think you're the one who deserves it <laughs> <laughs> at this point um okay well that's uh that's interesting so um okay let's change gears here i feel like we have a good understanding of those guys and uh now i mean you are a, obviously a direct you know student going down the lineage there um what can you let's talk collapsed rudiments something mm -hmm. that you mentioned to me about uh, hey maybe this is something we could talk about can you explain what it is and um and then maybe we'll get into your uh, most recent book and uh, let, yeah, let's talk rudiments. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, first of all, collapsed rudiments, I should, I should say is uh, it, it has been the, uh, I would say the favorite playground uh, of the late years of, uh, of Jim Chapin. And, and okay. I know he started thinking about that already somewhere back in the sixties. And uh, long story short, it's about taking a certain sticking, a rudiment, whatever it is, let's say a rudiment, and uh, you're, you're maintaining the sticking, you keep the, the order of right and left strokes, but you're changing the distances between the strokes. Uh, but you don't change the order of the sticking. It's just the rhythm that you change, it's not the sticking that you change. Hmm. So you collapse it, you collapse the pattern pretty much like a collapsing chair, if you will. You yeah. change distances like like an accordion that, that, yeah. that you take, and uh, and you 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 collapse and you expand it. That's pretty much the idea. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, that Jim was using a lot of that in his drum set concepts. Uh, so that was again another field of studies where. The topic of rudiments and drum set slash independence would meet. Um, collapsed rudiments can be also a great tool to better understand the relationship between certain patterns. Say, the single flammed mill is an offspring of the five stroke roll, such as uh, the paradiddle diddle uh, and the pada fla fla are related to each other because they have the same sticking but different rhythm. Hmm. Such as the single drag tab is an inward paradiddle, such as the the single paradiddle is also a flam accent. Uh, th th there are countless more, but uh, sure. understanding the relationship between rudimental patterns pretty much gives you a completely different view on the topic that also helps to uh, to understand drum set adaptations in. Uh, in yet a different way. Interesting. Now, it's not to be confused with like if you're on the computer and you're, you know, like let's imagine there's a swing knob where you go from dot 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 and you make it dot 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 and you're kind of playing with time. It's not to be confused. It's it's different than that, obviously, right? Where you're kind of still in time but you're pushing and pulling a little bit. Is that that's different, correct? Uh it it can it 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 it, use, it should be different yes uh, i mean but but it it definitely has to do with how far you take the game mm -hmm. uh, say if you if you play uh, a, a a paradiddle um let's say to 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 come up with a, with a super easy example and you have your paradiddle mm -hmm. and you can obviously just move from the paradiddle And uh, keep the sticking in the very same way, uh, and you also keep the pulse and the and the time in the very same spot. But you just change the diff change the distances between the notes 
that's pretty much the the basic concept that Jim was looking into. Gotcha. That makes perfect sense, and I appreciate you playing it. That doesn't happen often on the sh- often on the show, so um, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Awesome. Now, um, and then you as a teacher, so you are obviously a teacher. So, um, and we can talk about you know more at the end where people can find you and all that stuff. But if people wanted to learn this directly from you, I know you have a a pretty cool setup that's a very legitimate multi camera kind of good audio. Um, set up. So if people were to take lessons from you, this is the kind of stuff they can, they can learn directly from you, correct? Um, yes. And, uh, and, and I mean, some, sometimes people would say, oh boy, I, I'm having trouble with, uh, with understanding rudiments as they are. Um, mm-hmm. So why should I burden myself with yet another level of, of craziness? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, just, uh, <laughs> uh, just to cool things down a bit, uh, to me, the, the, the whole aspect of collapsing and expanding rudiments or collapsing and expanding certain stickings and patterns, it's not about creating complexity uh, by all means. It, it also can be used as a tool of methodology to point out relatively simple relationships between uh, certain right-left stickings. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to be complicated. But it, it really sheds a completely different light on a learning process uh, that includes sticking and, and accents. And okay. it, it's, it's quite astounding that the rhythmic aspect on top of that also makes it a bit easier to, uh, um, to come up with, um, say, more exotic uh, grids of subdivision. I mean, just to give you a, a, a relatively basic example, if you were to play a five-stroke roll, uh, and you were to expand that, all of a sudden you're getting into quintuplets, um, which. Uh, uh, once you're under the spell of, of still playing the five stroke role and you just look into even distances from stroke to stroke, you, you naturally, you naturally uh, seem to go into the quintuplet without having to think one, two, three, four, four, one, two, three, four, four, one, yeah. two, three, four, four, and, and breaking your tongue, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. So that's relatively easy, I think. And so collapsing and expanding patterns is something which can also be used in manifold applications which shed a different light on not just uh, certain technical aspects, but also certain rhythmical aspects and, uh, and, and the way you use a certain pattern on the pad or around the drums. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. And it's uh, obviously, like you said, you can use it around, around the drum set. So this isn't, um, I think growing up, I kind of had the um, mentality of um, always just being a rock drummer, guy on a drum set like i don't really need to practice rudiments i play on the drum set but now being like you know an adult i'm like boy i wish i would have spent more time doing that so that's why I'm kind of on a mission now to learn more of this stuff and uh because it, it applies for everything like you said you can use it everywhere it, it it pretty much does i mean um uh there's there there's still a a constant discussion going on is, is it is it something worth doing studying rudiments uh, and uh, and the answers to that questions may be different, and I understand that there are different answers from different people. Um, so uh, uh, so quite some 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 drummers would say, well, uh, rudiments that's that's the foundation of drumming. It's it's really the the basis of what we do. You may have that opinion, and and I think fair enough, and uh, and. It, it's totally true for, say, an army drummer 200 years ago. I mean, if you were not able to play the rudiments, you could not play your duty. You could not play the marches and the, and the orders and the drum yeah. beatings that you were supposed to play in the army. So for an army drummers, quite some years ago, it, it was the absolute foundation. Today, for a rock drummer, you may argue that, but still what you do is you play say certain arrangements of right and left strokes and some are softer and some are louder and uh, rudiments actually come as a compressed nucleus of certain right left 
loud soft arrangements. Hmm. So, so they, they, they actually uh, generate perfect exercises that, uh, that help you once you master these exercises to bring your musical imagination into life. So why not take that opportunity and, uh, and take advantage of that? Yeah. That, that's at least my point. No, I think that's exactly right where you look at, um, and I keep going back to it, but just because I'm taking lessons on it now, but looking at stick control, you'd look at the first couple pages and go, what, you know, this is just rights and lefts, but it's like, man, there's so much you can do with it. And it's exactly like what you're saying about just take that one little bit and expand it and turn it into something just to let, let your imagination go wild. I feel like the better of a drummer you are, the more you can pull out of you know, if you're playing piano, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Herbie Hancock or someone would play that completely different than a beginner and would get much more out of it just by knowing what, you know, the basics. Yeah, sure. And uh, I mean, finally, it all comes down to, to understanding the gap between what I used to call the drill zone and the game zone. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the drill zone may be something like, yeah, you, you learn the basics, you learn uh the 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 legacy you, you you study the traditions you learn the rudiments you you study stick control you study accents and rebounds you study all the legendary greats uh on whose shoulders uh, we are standing on mm -hmm. and uh and then putting that all to the game zone where you just try to forget about that and uh and and just enjoy the the fun of doing it yeah. and uh, jim usually used to say uh w when somebody was asking um what, what, what should I do with, with the techniques I, I now learned with you and, and the exercises I, I did with you? And, and the typical Chapin answer would be, give me 20 minutes daily in front of a mirror, and when you go on stage, forget you know me. <laughs> that's awesome. Forget you know me. Oh, it's so and, true. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that's one thing that made Jim outstanding as a teacher. He, he would not take himself so seriously that he would only be after the techniques. Jim was very much after the music, but he understood the connection between both. And, uh, and that, I think, is what makes uh, a good teacher a great teacher. Yeah. yeah. You're not learning this in a vacuum. You're, you're meant to go out and play and uh, ideally make it your own right to a little bit you know you want to keep the technique alive and everything but but be your own drummer um yes so um that's awesome let's hop over now and talk about your book camp duty update mm -hmm. which is just right in line with all of this um and the history and um i don't i want to be clear that i don't have it i haven't read it but i'm just looking at it online and i will definitely try and get my hands on it so um why don't you tell us about it well the the main intention of the book to me, or the main motivation, let's say, was I was I was trying to reconnect the drumming and the music, uh, and uh, and the, the the strange thing I thought was that at a certain point in time, the the drumming and uh, and the music s almost seemed to be separated. Now, say if 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 I'm if I'm bringing up the three camps, for instance, mm -hmm. I mean. Who out there still knows that the three camps, uh, as a drum beating, as, as a as a march, as a signal to to wake up troops, also has a fife melody? And who out there would be uh, uh, would be able to whistle that tune? So, so Very who true. would be aware of the music? And uh, it almost seems like okay, here's the rudiments and. Uh, Oh yeah, some some at some point back there, there there used to be music that the drumming would accompany, uh, but uh, we forgot the music and and only the the drumming and the rudiments were left as a short passage on a poster. I think that's very poor, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was the the main intention: reuniting the music and the drumming, and also understanding that the the drumming and the music has uh, has European. Uh, origins. So of most of that is Swiss and French. And to a certain degree, it may be, it, it, it may have some German influence as well. I mean, the, the borders between the countries back then, uh, during Renaissance times, of course, were much different as they are today. So this is why I say it has European roots, but 
the French and the Swiss origins are extremely strong with that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm, I'm giving some sort of a historic timeline of how uh, drumming developed beginning in the 14th century to the times of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. And then I present certain classic tunes from that, uh, from these times. I mean, starting with, uh, uh, with, with a piece from the, from the 1600s, uh, until say standards like the downfall of Paris and the three camps and the British grenadiers and Yankee doodle and Dixie and all of that. But I, I not just present the classic original tunes and, and the drum beatings uh, as they were used in their authentic way. I also present an updated version, which uses the same melody, same five tune, but uh, using influences from Basel drumming and collapsed rudiments, mm -hmm. that Chapin concept that we talked about earlier. Uh, and that also fits on the same melody. So yeah. I'm, I'm kind of uh, trying to reconnect the, the tradition of drumming from hundreds and hundreds of years ago to what we have today. And, uh, and there is very much of a common thread to it. And uh, it appears quite some people like it, w which I'm, of course, happy about. So, oh, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think your uh, attention to detail and... Um, I just think what I've learned from this show is people really, really enjoy and respond well to um, when people just really want to keep historical traditions alive and um, and if not modernize it a little bit to keep it, you know, relevant. And so you're not just printing out sheets of, you know, um, music where you're just playing the same thing. Um, yeah. And you come it has a CD with it. Obviously, I can see that. So um that's really cool. That's that's great. You're doing that, and uh, and and it's it's obvious. But you people don't need to be standing there in their full uniform with a rope tension drum to do this. I'm sure it would still be fun just to sit there in your living room, right? I mean, that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. yeah, but the 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 interesting thing still is that uh, uh, um, I mean the, the the feedback I'm getting on this uh, from from all kinds of drummers uh, say. Uh, David Garibaldi uh, is a big fan of it, and, and he also took a couple of lessons on, on stuff like that, um, just as Steve Smith was writing a, a testimonial for it, or Big Firth, or John Beck, or uh, a, a little funny story on the side, uh, which is just two days ago now. I, I, I came back home late, and uh, my phone is ringing, and, uh, uh, and believe it or not, it's Steve Gadd. So oh my God, would, would, would you think Steve Gadd is calling you and, and is asking you for a copy of camp duty update? Uh, <laughs> so I had to sit down and, uh, and have a drink after that. But yeah, so, it's exactly so, what I would do. <laughs> just, just saying. So, uh, so that's awesome. Obviously th there's something to it. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's so cool. And I just want to say we, 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 it, it, most people know it who are listening to this, but you yourself, I mean, obviously people can probably gather it from talking to you are an amazing drummer, both on the rudimental stuff and just getting you on a drum set, um, from watching videos and, and posting some on social media and stuff. Um, so you're a monster drummer, man. You're great. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I mean the, the, the whole rudimental act and, and all of this is, is pretty much, uh, uh, I, I would even call it like something like a hobby. It's, it's not, it's not something that, that I do for a living, but it, it just, uh, it just connects perfectly with uh, with my uh, main topic, with which which is still drum set playing, of course. But um, but understanding that uh, knowing about rudiments and the and the history part of it, and uh, and uh, just seeing how that puzzle of drumming uh, is uh, is sort of coming to uh, uh, to to a, a, a complete picture. Yeah. That's that's just something I enjoy so much that that I keep doing it, yeah. and uh, al although it's it's not what I really do for a living. Of course, I'm a drum set player, and I wouldn't call myself a Basel drummer or a a true rudimental shotgun. Th that that's not what I am. I I know a thing or two, and I can play a thing or two, but um, but I'm mostly a attracted by by the beauty of of these old rope tension. Uh, field drum 16 by 16 and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I just enjoy that 
uh, that voluminous and uh, and majestic sound, I should say. Yeah, yeah, they're um, they're works of art. I mean, really, I got a book from a friend, Mark Robertson, who's a great friend of the show, who sent me a book on them, and I've just like looked through, and it documents them all beautifully. And um, I think it was written by George Carroll. It's something I'm getting more and more into, where you appreciate the art of these rope tension drums. So I'm I'm right yeah. there with you. It's it's very cool. So Klaus, why don't we tell people here at the end um, where they can find you, the best way to take a lesson with you, take lessons with you. Um, so why don't you tell us all that good stuff? Uh, well, I mean, of, of course, uh, th there's my website, klaushessler.com, uh, which has a contact uh, formula which you can use to, uh, to contact me for any open lesson slots. That's possibly the easiest way uh, to go. Of course, there is... Uh, uh, there's Klaus.Hessler on Instagram. There is uh, uh, Klaus Hessler official on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not super active on, on that platform. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, 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 the usual ways to, uh, to find out about me. And uh, I'm quite easy to handle, so you don't need to be afraid. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's usually the treat. Yeah. That's funny. Man, this has been great. I've just learned so much from you. So, um, Klaus, I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the show. And uh, and it was great to meet you and talk with you. And, oh, I want to give a, a, a thank you to, I'm going to probably mess up the name, but Frank Denage, um, who originally recommended you and um, some other people I'm going to be talking to down the road, which I hope comes together. Um, so thank you to Frank um, for getting us, uh, putting the idea in my mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, oh, there, there's there's still one more thing which comes to my mind right now. Sure. Uh, I I just started a um, uh, uh, some educational output with uh, with an online uh, format which is called OpenMindedDrumming.com, and the first set of courses we have been putting out now is uh, um, say um, uh, an online seminar. Uh, which is learning about learning Swiss rudimental drumming from scratch. Oh, uh, wow. And I think there is no online information about that to, to really learn that uh, when you're not having the chance to, to study with somebody from Switzerland directly or whatever. So it's, uh, it's really some, some amazing footage, high quality stuff. Uh, booklet that comes with it. So if you want to check that out and, and you want to learn a, a bit more about my hobby, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're welcome to to check this out. OpenMindedDrumming.com. Man, that sounds like something I'd be interested in. Again, kind of, you need that you need that way to get into it. You know what I mean? You need because sometimes you'll look up videos and people are assuming that you grew up as a rudimental drummer, which it's like I can really play the drums like i know what i'm doing on the drum set but um that sounds perfect so i'm going to check that out um and I, I recommend everyone else does too yeah please do please do awesome klaus thanks for being here my friend it was super fun to talk drums with you and uh and and just as i i love playing the drums i love talking drums so uh, uh, so, so so you caught me on my weak spot <laughs> <laughs> me too thanks man <laughs> you're welcome thank you so much If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.